Calumet Editions, an eclectic publisher of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, introduced a new business model nearly a decade ago, in which the publisher and author work as equal partners in a joint venture. Their stable of authors have won numerous and prestigious prizes across literary forms. Where traditional publishers fail to see the value in projects, Calumet cooperates with his authors in realizing a book's potential. Welcome once again to Writer's Corner. Alan Miller with you. We have two award-winning writers. Uh, Minnesota seems to have so many of them. Uh, returning, he's been here once before, and to talk about his new book is Jeff Burton, who's on my right. And uh, we have a different type of a writer, uh, a woman who's won a bunch of awards for some outstanding short stories, Jana Locke, and she's going to write a novel one of these days because uh, it's a shame to waste that talent just on short stories. Oh, I don't think it's so. wasted, Alan. Okay, <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> so uh, how did you get into short stories? Everything from 100 words to quite a few words. Yes, well, I have been writing short stories all of my life. And I think the first one was fourth grade. <laughs> so, but it's only in the last five years that I really, and I actually got a uh, Master of uh, Fine Arts in writing um, uh, a little while after college. And so it's been a, it's been a love of mine for a very long time. Where and, was college? Uh, college was in Oregon. Uh, my father was a professor of theater at Lewis and Clark College. Oh. And so, in fact, I would say that was the origins of my love of story is what I saw on the stage, right? Because um, a playwright and, and actors and directors come together to captivate you with a story on stage. And I loved that ability to, to captivate an audience. And I, I, I'm not a theater person, but... I found my gift in writing, in words, and uh, so all of my life I've loved to write, And uh, but as I say, only in the last five years have I finally done a deep dive, and I'm teaching writing, I'm publishing short stories in different literary journals, and now finally I just have my first book. And won, so. and won some awards, and yes, uh, somewhere in Minnesota, which is right here, and we'll talk about it. Now, Jeff, on the other hand, uh, goes to the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I do. You know, but I, I did cut my eye teeth writing short stories um, years ago. My daughter was young. I was working full time and too terrified to do anything beyond a short story. But I think that's where I, I um, learned. I mean, I learned and I made every mistake humanly possible and hopefully learned. And I had a lot of really great 3,000 word short stories in like six or 7,000 words. So I had to learn how to whittle them down and, and make every, um, every single sentence count. And the, um, the uh, 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 dialogue takes, I had some interesting ones back then and I've you know, since kind of learned to kind of filter them to said and maybe replied in a few of the other ones. And not have some of the silly ones that I was plugging in randomly, but uh, learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes, and hopefully it made me a little better. One of the things Jana, <coughs> Jana mentioned before we went on air uh, was the fact that you work in humor into your articles, uh, into your stories. Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, some dark humor now and again, or if there's a character that's a little, uh, little flippant, you know, helps relieve the tension. And, uh, you know, keeps people involved and interested and keeps the pages turning. What was the inspiration for starting the book instead of just the short stories? Uh, well, the book is a collection of my short stories. Um, they have a few things in common. One is that they all take place in Minnesota. So the book is not really about Minnesota, but Minnesota with its lakes and its crazy winters and kind of wild weather patterns uh, makes a nice back backdrop 
for stories of grit and resilience. So, uh, so I've been saying writing. Saying goodbye to a, a campground. <laughs> sure, I'm inspired. I'm going to go right home and write that one. <laughs> no, um, you know it's. It, I love the lakes. I love the shores. I love you know our insane weather patterns and. So you combine that with interesting characters and the crazy things they're experiencing and, you know, and, and they can be inspired by all kinds of things like, you know, I work from writing prompts, for example, like one of our writing prompts in our writing group was, was the word key. And uh, so that inspired a story that takes place on the North Shore uh, of Lake Superior in Minnesota, uh, where a woman is walking along the beach. She's being very contemplative. Uh, she has just lost her mother and she's back in her hometown where she grew up and she's, she walks toward the beach and there's a body on the beach. And she goes and she's like, <laughs> what do I do? And she tries to look for some ID in the coat and she finds this key. And that's what launches the story. Have you? Uh by any chance, read David House Wright's new book? No. It starts off with uh, finding of a body. I love it. I will run right <laughs> out and buy that yeah. one. <laughs> now, where'd you get involved with all the dogs? Um, well, kind of a. Uh, I mean, I'm a dog person, as you know. I, I love know. dogs. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You've got that book you gave me that, yeah. I, that I enjoy. Um, you know, we've always been, my wife and I have always been dog people, um, but I was actually on jury duty, <clears throat> and I wound up, you know, here I've got to drive over to Hastings, and even though my wife's an attorney, my dad's an attorney, and when they kind of grill you for being on jury duty, I kept saying attorney over and over again, even though I'm not one, hoping that that would get me off, at least, to, <laughs> at least according to some of the John Grisham books, <clears throat> Yeah, and they they picked me. You know, I was getting my bags. I was all ready to get out the door, and they're <laughs> Jeff Furton. I'm like, but I said attorney. Let me go. And um, so I wound up being on a real complex uh, real estate case. And the first full day of the, um, the jury duty, I'm driving in, and on the radio, they're talking about um, some gentleman had walked it away from assisted living or a care facility, and that they were calling out the um, cadaver dogs, the human remains detection dogs. And so when you're on jury duty, you have a lot of hurry up and wait, you know, hurry up and wait. And so I and just you started. said, who's writing about cadaver dogs? I said, you know, nobody. I've seen, yeah, I've seen the, you know, explosives, the drugs, and all sorts of different kinds. <clears throat> I thought, well, what, what about, you know, human remains detection dogs? And uh, so even though they give you a, a um, you know, a yellow legal pad to fill out, which I, I did, but the last page, I was writing down ideas for the book, and when the trial was over, the um, judge came in, he thanked us, and then he said, Mr. Haliff will be here in a minute to get your yellow pads. <laughs> so I had to, suddenly I'm 13 again, trying to sneak yeah. the last thing out and <laughs> shove it in my pocket without getting contempt of court or, <laughs> you know. So, um, and, and folks have, have um, I mean, I, I get emails from people that have telling me all about their different dogs and everything, and, and so it's, it's all great fun. It's been, it's been a fun ride. And you had three, really, with the cadaver dogs, but your new one is a little bit different, the dead years. You really have a, a brother and sister. Right. Uh, but right. their dog is, is certainly instrumental also. Their dogs are instrumental. They may not be the um, mm -hmm. front burner, maybe a little more on the back burner. But I, um, I've got an idea drawer at, in the kitchen, and it's, it's nothing sexy. It's just where I open the drawer and I toss my car keys and my wallet when I come and go. And during COVID, my wife and I would um, stream just endless shows and a lot of true crime documentaries. And so um, where the dead years came from is I had written down on a piece of scratch paper, what happens if a serial killer is not happy with his portrayal in a Netflix documentary? And I tossed that in the drawer 
but I, I still had another book or two to do for St. Martin's. And uh, so that thing kept looking at me. Every time I opened the drawer, it's peeking up at me. And then, I don't know, a year or two ago, I was able to um, actually sit down and write the dead years with a new cast of characters. And, and dogs. And dogs. Yeah. And dogs. Well, Katie, my Springer, has oh, yeah. got a much more yes. prominent... Uh, She's got a much more prominent role in, in my new book, which is about 80% finished now. Excellent. And uh, it's on uh, censorship and book book banning. Oh, okay. And so it's the, nonfiction? Or? And it's, no, it's fiction. It's, uh, it can't be classed as a thriller because it's, it's more just a novel. Okay. But uh, yeah, hopefully so Did he inspire you with his dog stories? No, I've always been a dog person also, Yeah, and rescues only, and uh, a series of them. Ideas, where do your ideas come from? Uh, well, as you mentioned, prompts, um, and then mm. I love just observing people, and you know, you might see someone walking along a sidewalk, you know, with a strange gate or looking down or something and I think what's their story and then I also like to ask a lot of what if questions what if uh, someone went to Italy just you know to escape a horrible breakup just as COVID was starting and was exploding there what was it like so you know you mentioned research I think in an email we had in um, the importance of that, and I, so I, that was an opportunity to research because even though COVID was such recent history, I discovered that there were so many details I either didn't know because it was, you know, different things happen in different places around the world. Um, but when exactly did this happen? Did that happen? Did, did things start to really explode in Italy? Um, and so it was, that was kind of, um, an interesting story for me to to write um, because it was inspired by COVID. It was inspired by one person's story and kind of how they experienced the that um, the escalation and what was happening with all the events at the time. And in the back of your book, you have book club discussion questions. Yes, which not everybody does, but you know, I no, I found that. That writers who do that uh, uh, really inspire book clubs to look at their books. Et I love book clubs. I'm I'm involved <laughs> in two book clubs. I read about forty books a year, and uh, so I I think facilitating discussion is is a wonderful thing for an author to do. I mean, as I was thinking about all these stories, I thought, well, why is this character motivated to do this? You know what would make someone think that way and so those you know naturally lead to some good things to to talk about right you know i i was really disappointed on how i did a lot of book clubs pre-covid mm -hmm. and then covid kind of knocked those out for a little bit mm -hmm. and i had never been a member of a book club and so you know when i showed up at my first one you know i had <laughs> copious notes and i'm like well what am i going to be like the professor talking for <laughs> and i come in and on their island is all sorts of food. You and know, wine. And they've got pizza and they've got booze. They've got <laughs> yeah. booze. Of course. And I'm like, for me? And, um, you know, at some point, everybody would walk into the living room and they're like, Jeff, we're ready. And I'm, I'll be right there, you know. And I'm so lucky that I never had to, like, um, call my wife to have her drive across the city to pick me up and then come back the next day to get my car because... Like you said, yeah, they're, oh, some wine? Oh, okay, we'll have, you know. Um, so, yeah, I really, really miss those, but I'd I like, be a lot heavier. If I, I like to do presentations <laughs> to book clubs more than, you know, going into a bookstore uh, and sitting there for a couple of hours to sign some books and things like that. I don't, you know, I don't know what your experience is in that regard, but book clubs really get into it. And uh, especially they read your book before you get there. And uh, it just is very beneficial in terms of me. That's my favorite way to introduce my book. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. And, and as you and I were talking earlier about Zoom, I mean, I've done Zoom with um, bookstores around the country. And, you know, it's just kind of 
so different because you don't have the human interaction right in front of you. And so you're, you know, you're hoping you're coming across and there's not dead air and you're just going, oh, well, this is looking weird. And I think um, a funny one that I had with an online book club was one of the people had wound up going to my high school only 20 years earlier. So we kind of stopped everything and talked about that for a while, you know. Um, How fun. But yeah, yeah. So I mean, it is kind of, I, I, I enjoy library talks and I just love book clubs. Yeah, library talks also. And you say you're in two book clubs? Yes. <clears throat> Not talking about your books necessarily. Or no, your book. although my, my book club people are, are reading my book, and yeah. that's been delightful because uh, it's been very confidence-inspiring because they, they love the book, and they've given me so much wonderful feedback. Um, you know, as a writer, you kind of write in a vacuum, as they say, and so to finally get that feedback and to know that people really enjoy your stories is, is thrilling. So you've been at it much longer than me, Jeff, but um, this is a brand new book. It's only just a few months out, so, okay. yeah. And so what's I'm, next? Well, I am currently working on a new collection of short stories, and yes, I will one day write a novel. I'm pretty sure of that, <laughs> but um, the next, so this is really kind of solidly in the literary fiction genre. Um, Next, the next collection is really genre stories, which there's some murder mysteries and some ghost stories and some magical realism and so, and it's called The Wimden Chronicles. And Wimden is a um, fictional town in Minnesota that does not exist. Yeah. And uh, everything happens around that? Everything or? happens in Win Wimden, yes. <laughs> oh, very interesting. Jeff, what's on the docket for you? Um, the Dead Years came out in March, and the second book, called The Second Grave, um, comes out in February, and then I... Uh, now, is that a continuation of it, The Dead Years? It is. The same characters? It is the same characters. Um, so you did the trilogy with the finders, and now this is... And now I, yeah, in fact, um, this week I, I signed with uh, Severn House for a, a third novel in, in the series, so... You know, and I never, I never really start out, when I wrote The Finders, it was a, um, you know, kind of, it was done. It was, hey, here's a, here's a book, it's done, but then, um, you know, the publisher is like, they want, you know, they want to have a series, and your agent, of course, wants to have a series. Cause, um, and so I did that. And then The Dead Years also was kind of, um, you know, basically, well, here's, here's the idea on, on, you know, the guy not being happy with his, his documentary and what happens then. Uh, but they liked it. And they said, well, can we give you a two-book deal? And whenever a publisher says they want to sign you to two books, there's, For sure. there's one answer. Yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. Where's the paper? Where's the paper? Now, do you have an agent? Not yet. Because no. I don't have one either, and uh, although I'm on my third novel, but uh, you have an agent. I have an agent. I had um, years ago. I had you know an agent for about a week and a half. You know, I had a, a book several books ago. And I was so excited, because sometimes getting an agent can be very, very difficult. Sometimes mm -hmm. more difficult than publishing than a book. publishing the book. And um, so the guy, you know, I was so excited, and then he, he ran it by some major houses, and they, they kind of declined it, and then he, he dumped me. And I'm like, but, but a month ago, I, I was excited, and now <laughs> you're, you know. Um, and so, I mean, it's it's it's. I'm guessing he's regretting his choice now. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> I, can, I can only hope so. You know, th there is an adage in, in the business. Uh, I taught screenwriting for quite a while, and uh, you know, I have a lot of unpublished <laughs> screenplays. Scripts. But uh, if you present it to somebody who is working in the studio, 
the readers, they're usually kids who just came out of college. And if they say it's great and it's not, they lose their job. So turning them down, which is similar to your experience, is more successful to keeping your job, but not necessarily uh, oh, you know, passing yeah. on a good uh, screenplay. And uh, it's unfortunate, but that's the way the system works. Right, right. And, uh, <clears throat> so where do you find a publisher? Uh, so this book is published through a hybrid publisher right in this area, Kirkhouse Publishers. And, very uh, good people. They, yes. They're very helpful. Yes. And uh, lovely. Do all of that back end stuff that. Did keeps they do you the actually... editing and the line editing for you no, also? No, I am my own editor. I'm oh. an ac expert editor, so I edit my own work. <laughs> but um, they did all of that, all of the paperwork key kind of things and ISBN number and. And all of that, and they also have a printing house, and so they are able to print on demand and things like that. So there's, there was just a lot of nice um, benefits of working with them. Good people. Good yes. people, yes. Absolutely. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And yours is different now. You're overseas. I am overseas with the Dead Years. Um, Severn House is a crime imprint of Canongate Books. And um, they've been around about 50 years, and they're in London. And I was telling you earlier, I've got family over there, so I'm thinking maybe I can uh, take a trip and just have coffee with them and then write off the entire trip. So hopefully you don't have any IRS agents watching, <laughs> watching the show. Uh, that's what writers do. <laughs> yeah. And it's perfectly legitimate. It is legitimate. Yeah. 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 Um, we were just uh, in Portugal earlier this year. So Portugal will be in my next book. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> nice. It. But uh, well, Jana, can I just you're, you're teaching um, creative writing, short stories. What are some of the stuff that you try to try to tell them? Shake well, their arms I, and say. you know, I think uh, the the writing process is so intriguing, isn't it? I mean, we all think you know, oh, there's got to be some formula for the perfect story. Um, what's that formula? And and you think, well, you've got to have great characters, and you've got to have a good storyline and and the storytelling itself um, you've got to have there's some mechanics right that that make it work um, but what what's, what I find is so hard to teach is is and I wanted to tell you this that I just I you know I just mentioned before we started that I just finished reading the finders and I thought this is like I could use this as a teaching tool it's oh. like the perfect story because it has all the mechanical stuff it it's it's engaging. It flows. It's compelling. The the character, main character is fantastic, um, but there is something that a really great writer brings to the storytelling that is so hard to teach, and it's it's that little bit of magic. So what is that? You know, I I tell people add a layer, put something surprising in there. Let's. Let's shake it up. You know, you think, okay, we have to get character from point A to B to C, right? And then, you know, you've got your beginning, middle, and end. But there's so much more to it than that, right? Like, how do we, how do we engage, delight, and entertain the reader while telling that story? And learn to edit. And learn to edit, yes. I used to believe that anything that I wrote was written in stone, and therefore you couldn't touch it. And boy, you have to disabuse yourself of you that do. belief early on. Well said. Research and editing are so helpful to writing. <clears throat> yes. Well, and they say kill your darlings, right? I mean, what does that even mean, right? It's, I mean, you you shouldn't just wipe things out because it's too precious to you. Sometimes a precious thing is the, is precious for a good reason, right? But. But to be judicious and to say, does this add to the story? Does this move the story forward? Does it help the reader to really stay engaged in the story, right? So it, there are a lot of things that go into what do you edit out? And this has become very important because we have a lot of people who have picked up this show, even though it's only a year and a half old. And everybody thinks that they are a writer. 
and everybody can be a writer, but they have to be willing to take the frustration and do the yes. editing and, you know, copy after copy after copy. Mm -hmm. Throw it away if you don't like it, if there's a problem with it. Uh, and that is one thing that I tell people is, you know, okay, so you've written this story, you've done a kind of a, uh, an edit to get it cleaner, to get it to flow and all those things, read it again with, yeah, after time away, you know, and take, take time. Don't rush. There's no reason to rush. Um, take time to read it again and to find the flaws and, and have a fresh perspective. And then when you think it's done, read it again. And then research. Obviously, you had to do a lot of research on cadaver dogs and uh, get that experience. I mean, the research yeah, is so important. I'm a, I'm a geek. I'm a research geek. And I mean, it's just amazing. <clears throat> Dogs are supernatural. Um, 300 million scent receptors, whereas we just have uh, 5 million. And I went to uh, Twisters in the movie theater the other day, and I just had a popcorn. <laughs> you know, you've got the popcorn smell, and maybe, you know, you can smell burning leaves and if your milk goes bad. Uh, but once I hit double digits, I run out of what I can ascertain that that smell is, whereas dogs hit thousands. They're little databases. Yeah. And um, they're also just uh, swashbucklers. I mean, until they're into their middle age, you see them take off after a rabbit. They're like, you know, just crazy. They're like... Uh, Errol Flynn in The Adventures of Robin Hood. <laughs> and I got to even um, tell my wife, we had an Australian shepherd that we have an upper yard and a lower yard. And every year or two, I, I have to say, did Amber truly fly from the upper one and, you know, plummet, you know, however many and hit the ground and kept running? She goes, yes, that happened. And I'm like, I'd be in a wheelchair, <laughs> you know. And believe it or not, we have gone through our half hour. It goes so quickly. It does. Wow. Jeff Burton, uh, <laughs> whose latest book is right there in front of us, The Dead Years. Uh, Jana Locke, first time here. And uh, you'll come back again. Uh, I'd love to. Enjoy. It's been a pleasure having Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Alan. Somewhere in Minnesota. And... Writer's Corner is signing off. <laughs>